33-year-old Nicola Raybon was a nurse who also studied criminology in college. In January of 2012, she was thrilled to move into a new house in Lancashire with her partner John and her two kids. And then later that month, she and her family flew out to the Caribbean island of Antigua to attend her father's second marriage. And while she was excited for her father, she was mostly just excited about the pampering she was going to get from the five-star hotel she was staying in. On the first night they arrived, Nicola went down to the bar to have a couple drinks with her friends. Now, Nicola was not known for being a big drinker or partier. In fact, she was more well known for her work with different charities and for being a really dedicated mother. In fact, one time after her children were named mascots for a local soccer team, Nicola apparently lost sleep. She was so excited for them. After Nicola had a few drinks, her friends said they were going to leave and go to a restaurant to grab some dinner. And they asked her if she wanted to come. And Nicola declined and she said, you know what? I'd rather just go watch the sunset up on the beach. You guys have a good time. After her friends left, Nicola walked up the steps onto the beach. She took her sandals off and took her phone out of her pocket and she put them on a chair and she walked off. Later that night, Nicola's father was supposed to meet up with his daughter, but when he went to their meeting spot, she didn't show up. And so he walked around the hotel asking different guests if they'd seen her and no one seemed to know where she was, but that group of friends that had sat with her at the bar, he found them and they said, oh yeah, she went on the beach to watch the sunset. And so Nicola's father actually smiled to himself because he thought, great, I can go on the beach, find my daughter and finally have a chance to have, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her because ever since I got to Antigua, I've been surrounded by guests and I barely had a chance to talk to her. And so Nicola's father walks up to the beach and he looks around and he doesn't see his daughter and it's starting to get dark. So he figures, you know what, I'll give her a call. And so he calls his daughter and she doesn't pick up. And he thinks, okay, she probably just isn't looking at her phone. After that, he called Nicola's partner, John, and he picked up and he said, no, I haven't seen her. The last I heard, I thought she was going to the beach. That's what her friend said. And Nicola's father said, yeah, that's where I am and I can't find her, but I'm sure she's somewhere. And so after he hung up with John, Nicola's father went back into the hotel and he asked Nicola's kids if they had seen her and they said no. And so now feeling a little bit concerned, Nicola's father rounds up a couple of guests to go help him look for his daughter. And so they go up on the beach and one of them quickly discovers Nicola's cell phone and sandals sitting on that chair near the hotel. And so right away, it just seems like this is a big red flag. She's out on the beach. We don't know where she is. She doesn't have her phone. And so now Nicola's father is really worried and he calls the police. Then at some point, as the search party moved farther and farther down the beach, they heard the sound of someone screaming in the distance. And it sounded like a woman and Nicola's father said it sounded like his daughter. Daughter. And so they all start running in the direction of the screaming, but it's so far away and it's so dark that they can't make out who it is or even where they are. And after they ran down the beach a ways, the screaming just stopped. And so they really couldn't figure out who it was. And so everyone's just stumped and overwhelmed by the situation. And for the rest of the night, they just continued to look around the beach and they never found the screaming woman and they never found Nicola. The next morning when the police were still on the beach looking for Nicola and now looking in the hotel as well, the tide went out and that's when they discovered Nicola. After she left the bar, Nicola did go up onto the beach to watch the sunset. And she did it by going down to the water and just walking along the water's edge. And so as she walked away from the resort watching this beautiful sunset, she walked deeper and deeper into the water until she was almost waist deep. And at some point she hit a patch of quicksand and sunk into it. And so she began screaming and yelling for help, but no one could hear her because she was so far away from the resort. And so for hours she sat there as the tide slowly came in and she was just pinned waiting to drown. And then finally, when people realized she was missing and that search party was within earshot of her, it was too late. The water levels were already at her neck. And by the time they actually got up pretty close to her, the water had gone over her head and she drowned. It turned out the search party was basically right next to her. But by the time they got there, she was already underwater so they couldn't see her. Growing up in Oklahoma, Blake Stanfield loved going out in the wilderness with his father, Neil. The pair were more like best friends than father and son, and they spent as much time together as they possibly could. But by the time Blake was in his 30s, he had become a medical doctor, and so he was really busy, and he was married, and he had a young kid, and so he didn't see his father very much. And then in 2003, when Blake was 38, he moved his family to Alaska, and so he really didn't see his father anymore. But shortly after moving, Blake had an idea. He wanted to surprise his dad on his 65th birthday with a rafting trip in Alaska. It was going to be this great way for the two to reconnect with each other. When he broke the news to his father, Neil was really touched by it and very excited, but at the same time, he was a little bit apprehensive. And he asked his son, you know, are we going in a group? Is this going to be a guided rafting trip? 
And Blake said, oh no, that's, that's the wrong way to do this. We will not have a good time if we go with a group. We're doing this alone. And so Neil said, well, isn't that a little bit risky? Just the two of us out in the middle of Alaska? And Blake said, don't worry. I picked a river that by Alaskan standards is considered leisurely, so we'll be just fine. Neil was still hesitant about it, but the two of them were very competent outdoorsmen, and so ultimately he just went along with it. So later that year, in early July, Blake and Neil took a float plane out to the gates of the Arctic National Park in Alaska. This park is totally beautiful, but it's also very dangerous because it's full of grizzly bears and wolves, and it's also very remote. There's no people anywhere near this park. It's basically untouched wilderness. Adding to the isolation and danger, Blake and Neil did not have their cell phones or a radio. It was Blake's idea. He said it would be a good idea for us to just totally disconnect and just spend quality time together. And then also Blake had chosen a starting point on this river that was situated basically right in the middle of the park, which meant it was 60 miles away from the nearest human settlement. So after they got dropped off by this float plane and then the captain of that plane took off again, Blake and Neil loaded their stuff into the raft and then they hopped in and they started cruising down this river. At first, their trip was awesome. The weather was perfect. The landscape was beautiful. The water was totally calm and Neil, he might have had reservations about the safety of this trip, but quickly he was overcome with just how, how peaceful it was and how wonderful it was to be with just his son out on the open water. And in fact, Blake had intentionally booked this trip two weeks before the start of the official rafting season in Alaska, which meant really there was nobody else in the water. It was just those two. And they thought, wow, what luck except it turns out there's a very specific reason why the rafting season starts when it does in Alaska, because that's the earliest the ice melts in the river and it becomes safe to travel on. After two hours of peace and tranquility out on this river, Blake and Neil started to notice these large ice chunks in the water ahead of them. And they were easy enough to get around, but as they kept moving, the current was picking up and these ice chunks got bigger and bigger until they started being these huge sheets all across the edges of the river where there was only a narrow strip of water they could travel through. And at some point, Neil asked Blake if it would be a good idea to just pull the raft over to the side of the river and get out and reassess the situation and see if we've reached a anomaly in the river where just this section is frozen, or if this is gonna continue for a lot farther, and if so, we need to make alternative plans here. But Blake was not having it. He was stubborn, he wanted to keep going, and he was convinced he could maneuver the boat around the ice. And he said, let's just keep going a little bit farther. And so when they went a little bit farther, they reached a point where the current was so strong that they could no longer get out of the river. They had to ride it like a rapid until it stopped. And so as the father and son are fighting with each other about not having gotten out of the river while they still had a chance, they were not paying attention to what was in front of them. And they came around a corner and there was this huge ice shelf that was right across the whole river that basically blocked the whole path. And they turned at the last second. They couldn't do anything either way, but the nose of the raft went directly under the ice shelf and it flipped the raft onto its side, dumping Neil and Blake into frigid Alaskan waters underneath the ice shelf. And Blake would later say that he really believed that this was it. He didn't know how far this ice shelf was gonna go on for. And so he assumed I'm about to drown but they managed to hit this air pocket inside of this ice shelf. The ice basically formed up at a bow and they both happened to pop up into it and they gripped onto the ice. And they're looking at each other and they have no idea how long this ice shelf continues, but the current is pulling them and they know it's just a matter of time before they get sucked under and go back under the ice. And so they look at each other and they don't really know what to say, but it's kind of obvious that they think they're about to drown. And then at some point, Neil gets sucked under and swept away and then Blake falls follows shortly after. And then fortunately, they only tumbled along for about 10 or 15 more feet before they popped up again. But much like the boat that could not paddle out of the river because of how strong the current was, Blake and Neil could not get out of the river in time before they hit yet another ice shelf. And the next ice shelf was much longer than the first. And so they knew it was gonna happen. They grabbed onto the ice shelf and they're holding on and they're trying to pull themselves back out, but the current's too strong. And at some point they each had to take a big breath and then let go and got pulled directly under the ice. And so the whole time they're pressing their face up against the underside of this ice in hopes they find an air pocket, but they don't. And so the whole time they're just desperately looking for air and they're bumping into the underside of the ice. They have no idea how long it's gonna go on for. And so after what felt like an eternity, Blake finally gets shot out the backside of this huge ice shelf 
and he's still in the river, but there's no more ice shelves in front of him and the current had slowed down a little bit. So he was able to make his way to the edge and get out of the water. And he turned to face the water and his dad was nowhere to be found. And so Blake turns and he doesn't see his father coming out of the ice. He doesn't know if he's still under, if he came out again. And so he turns and runs downstream in hopes that he might have come out already. And sure enough, he found his dad clutching a rock in the middle of this river farther up. His head was badly bleeding, but he was alive. And so Blake grabbed a stick and was able to bring his father back into shore. Even though they had survived being pulled under the ice, they now had no equipment, no gear, no food, no water, no anything, because it was pulled under the water and they were soaking wet and becoming hypothermic and they're in the middle of nowhere with no one nearby to help them and no one's expecting them for a week and no planes are going to be in the area for two weeks. Fortunately, Blake had a lighter in his pocket that worked, and so they were able to start a fire and stay warm, and they were able to scare away grizzly bears and wolves. Blake finally walked away from their campsite, which was up on a mountain, and he went down to this river where he was able to flag down a float plane that was not even scheduled to be in the area. It was just totally random, and they saw Blake, they came back, they picked him up, and both men were just fine. They did say that even though the trip was a complete disaster and nearly killed both of them, it did reconnect them in a way that that few things could and their relationship is good as ever, but they both say they will never go rafting again. On July 10th, 1941, a brand new British submarine was commissioned called HMS Umpire. Nine days later, on July 19th, the submarine and her crew were told to meet up with a convoy moving north along the Medway River in England and make their way to Scotland. So Umpire joined up with the convoy, but then they started having engine problems that night and they began drifting back behind the convoy until they were basically not in the convoy anymore at all. During this time, the commander of the submarine was up in the bridge, which is the area that controls the submarine when it's above surface, just above the wing. The captain of the umpire was concerned this convoy would not see them when they came through because they were a submarine. So they're sitting low in the water and they're already all dark. They have no lights on the outside on purpose because this was during World War II and they didn't want German ships or planes to spot them. And because of their engine problems, they had drifted away from their convoy, which would have been protection. So the captain decides to deviate from their course to get the submarine clearly out of the way of this convoy. And so when he started turning the submarine, the steering broke, leaving the submarine now turned so its entire side is now facing this convoy and they were still drifting directly towards this convoy. And so sure enough, before the captain could do anything, one of the larger ships struck the side of the submarine, immediately flooding their forward torpedo room. And for a brief second, the submarine and the ship were kind of mangled together. And then it slipped off the ship and it sunk all the way to the bottom, 18 meters down. The captain, along with the other three men that were up on the bridge with him when they were struck, they managed to leap out at the last second and were treading water when this all happened. As for the other 34 crew members, they were stuck inside when it sunk. A number of the crew had been sleeping at the time of the crash, and so all they felt was this crash, the power goes out, they leap out of their beds, and they're landing in waist-deep water, and they're running out into the halls, kind of fumbling around because they can't see anything, and, and all they can hear is the sound of water pouring inside of their submarine. And so these sailors had gone through all sorts of drills to prepare for this type of scenario where, you know, power is out and you're sinking, and so they know by touch how to get to the one area that has an escape hatch, which is the engine room. And after 20 of them got inside the engine room, the water levels in the hallway were getting so high that it was spilling into that room. And it was getting to the point where if they didn't seal the door, they were going to flood this one room that was their only chance of survival. And so they had to make the heartbreaking decision to lock and seal that door, meaning the 14 other sailors on the other side, if they hadn't already died, were now condemned. But for the 20 men who now were gonna be able to use this escape hatch, there was no guarantee that would work because to use the escape hatch on a submarine, you need to understand how it works. You can't just open a hatch on a submarine. It won't open. The pressure from the seawater presses down on it to where it literally cannot open. You might be able to open it a crack if you use a tool, but that's about it. In order to open the escape hatch, you need to use something called a lockout chamber. And so a lockout chamber is like this really tight claustrophobia inducing thing that looks an awful lot like a gas chamber where you step through one hatch and you shut it and you seal it so it's watertight. And then above you is your escape hatch. 
but you can't open it until the pressure inside of the chamber has been equalized. And the way they do that is they flood the inside of the chamber the escapee is in. And so you're standing inside of this tight space, totally sealed in, and there's a control panel inside the chamber itself and also inside the sub, if you're lucky enough to have someone do that for you. You turn on the chamber, at which point water is dumped inside of this tight space you're in until it's completely full and you're holding your breath, at which point you've now equalized. The pressure inside the chamber is equal to that outside and you can actually open the hatch. So the person inside on a breath hold undoes the hatch, opens it up, and then hopefully your swim isn't too far because you're already on a breath hold and you swim to the surface. And during World War II, submariners were outfitted with a special piece of equipment if they ever needed to leave via the escape hatch. And it was their Davis escape gear, which is basically this life jacket that's uninflated. And when you manually activate it, it suddenly inflates and so when you go through that hatch, you would activate it and it would assist you to get to the surface. And so after those 20 sailors had decided to seal off the engine room, they immediately shifted focus and began getting guys into the escape hatch. And one of their most junior sailors, a guy by the name of Killian, said he would stay inside the room and operate the control panel so everybody else had the best chance of getting out of the escape hatch. And so sure enough, he put all 19 into the hatch and he got them out of the submarine. And then he, on his own, had to get in the hatch, seal it himself and control the panel in total darkness, flood the space, open it up and shoot to the surface. He would live and he would be awarded the British Empire Medal for Bravery. One junior officer named Edward Jones was one of the 14 men that did not get to the engine room before they sealed it off. And when he got there and realized the situation, he turned around and looked down the hall and there were only three other men that were standing there. And he didn't know how many had made it in the engine room. He figured this was the only four that had not made the cut. But in fact, there was actually 10 other people that were just stuck in various places inside of the submarine. But Jones decided he only had these guys in front of him. And so he said, hey, come with me, I have an idea. As Jones led them down this hallway, the water levels had risen up to their necks and all these circuits on the walls were starting to spark all around them. And so Jones led them to the middle of the submarine and then he turned and went up into the control room. And then from the control room, he went even farther up into what's called the conning tower. The conning tower is a submarine's main attack center. It's where you have those periscopes they look around in and it also has the firing buttons for their torpedoes. It is not designed to be an escape hatch because once you flood the conning tower, there's no control panel like there is on an escape hatch to drain the water that was used to equalize in order to open the hatch. So once the water's in, it's either you get to the surface or you drown. Also, in order to exit out of the conning tower, you need to go through this very narrow tube that goes straight up and it's got a ladder through it that can barely fit one person climbing up, meaning the people at the bottom of the ladder will have to hold their breath a lot longer than the people at the top. So Jones and the other three sailors, they get to the conning tower and they seal the hatch at their feet. So blocking the hallway flood from coming into where they are. And they realize that even though they have to do this, there are no other alternatives here that realistically one or two or more are gonna die in the process of just trying to get out of the submarine. But it was all they could do, so they made peace with their decision. They climbed up and they opened the hatch just enough to let water come in, but quite a bit started coming in. The men wedged themselves as high up in the tunnel as they possibly could, but obviously not everybody could get all the way up to the hatch. And so two were down low and Edward Jones and one other were up towards the top. And Jones would say that at first they were talking and praying, and then when they started feeling the water get closer and closer to their heads, they went silent. And then Jones remembers keeping his hand on the one man that was below him. And when his hand was wet, he knew the two men below him were completely submerged. And then the water came up to his face, covered his head. And at that point, he opened it up and they swam out. Of the four men in the conning tower, only Edward Jones and the other guy who was high up in the tunnel with him made it to the surface. All told, only 14 of the 38 total crew survived the accident. A 28-year-old Russian man named Artyom Sidorkin started having severe chest pains. And at first, he tried to ignore it, but it got so bad he could barely stand up, and then he began coughing up blood, and so finally he went to the emergency room. When he got there, even before the doctors examined him or gave him an x-ray, just based on the way he presented to them being pale in the face and hunched over and very sick looking, they assumed this must be something very serious. So that day, they brought Mr. Sidorkin in for an examination, and after talking to him and hearing about all of his symptoms and just 
looking at him, the assumption was he probably has a tumor in his lungs. And so they sent him in for an x-ray and afterwards the radiologist looked at the x-ray and confirmed that, yep, there is a mass growing inside of your lungs. And so before they went to just start removing huge pieces of his lung, they told him that they would like to do a biopsy where they remove a small piece of the tissue and test it to see if it's cancerous or not. And so Mr. Sidorkin is terrified, but he says, okay, he schedules his surgery. He goes in a couple days later and the surgeon pulls out a piece of his lung tissue. And as it's sitting on the tray, he looks down at the tissue, the surgeon does, and he realizes there is something hidden inside of the tissue as if the tissue was like an envelope holding something inside of it. And so he opened it up and there growing on the side of his lung was a small fir tree. It was five centimeters long. It was green. It looked very lively. It was just a thriving little tree. The doctors believed Mr. Sidorkin, who was a botanist, had inhaled a seed of a fir tree and it got lodged inside of his lung tissue. And then as it grew, its pine needles began and piercing his blood capillaries, causing him to cough up blood. After the discovery of what was inside of his lung, a spokeswoman for the Royal Botanic Gardens in London said that it is possible for a seed to germinate inside of the dark, damp conditions inside of a lung, but it is unbelievably bizarre. When doctors informed Mr. Sidorkin that he did not have cancer, he had a tree. Mr. Sidorkin was shocked and he said, I never got the sense that there was a tree growing inside of me. But more than shocked, he was just relieved that he was cancer free. There is a picture of this tree inside of his lung tissue, but it's a bit graphic. So if you want to see it, go ahead and Google tree and lung and I'm sure you'll find it. Growing up, Pauline Dakin always suspected that there was just something off about her family. Years later, she would find out she was right. In 1970, when she was five years old, her parents, Ruth and Warren, separated. And to Pauline, it wasn't that much of a shock because her father, Warren, was a heavy drinker and he's extremely violent. But after they separated and Pauline, her mother and brother had moved into another house on the other side of Vancouver, Canada, Pauline noticed her mom started to act really anxious all the time, but she never knew why. When Pauline was nine, her mother told her and her brother that they were gonna go on a vacation to Winnipeg, which is 1,000 miles away from Vancouver and so they loaded up the van they hopped in and they drove all the way to Winnipeg and when they got out they went inside their new vacation home and Ruth informed her children that they were actually never going back to Vancouver and when Pauline and her brother said why dad's still back in Vancouver I want to see dad but Pauline said sorry kids this is the way it has to be and when you're old enough I'll explain everything Confused and sad, Pauline and her brother began starting a new life in Winnipeg. Over the next four years, Pauline never saw her father and so she lost touch with him. But she started making a couple close friends in Winnipeg and she was starting to feel like this was home. But right as she was starting to feel normal, her mother told her and her brother that they needed to move right now all over again. This time they were gonna go all the way to New Brunswick, the far east side of Canada. Their mother made them swear they would tell no one about this move. But later that day, when Pauline was with her best friend, Wendy, she let it slip that she was moving. And so when Ruth came to pick Pauline up from Wendy's house, the two girls had to affect these sort of breezy goodbyes to each other so that Pauline's mother wouldn't suspect anything. Once in New Brunswick, the family did put down roots and they stayed there for many years. But Pauline's mother still was just incredibly anxious and paranoid about something. The kids just had no idea what it was. Fast forward to 1988, when Pauline was 23 years old, she had moved two hours away from the family home in New Brunswick and was living with her boyfriend and was working as a reporter at a local newspaper. And during that time, her mother called her and said, hey, I'd like to meet you at a motel. I'm finally ready to tell you everything about your childhood. Pauline was really intrigued and excited. This was a conversation that was literally decades in the making. And so Pauline eagerly went to the motel. She saw her mother waiting outside, kind of pacing around, looking very anxious. And so she walks up to her mom and she waves and she's about to speak when her mother just looks up at her and puts her finger over her lips, telling her to be quiet. And then she jams an envelope into Pauline's hands. And on the envelope, it just says, don't say anything. Put your jewelry inside of this envelope. It's probably bugged. I will explain everything inside. Just please don't speak. And so now Pauline's really confused, but she did as she was told. She took her jewelry off, 
put it in the envelope and gave it back to her mother, and then the two of them silently walked into the motel into the room where Pauline's mother was staying. When they went inside, there was a man sitting in the middle of the room that Pauline immediately recognized. It was the reverend of their church when they used to live in Vancouver. His name was Stan Sears, and Pauline's mother had been his secretary the whole time they'd gone to that church. Pauline always knew her mother and Stan were close friends, and in fact had kept in touch after they left Vancouver and were in Winnipeg and then New Brunswick. In fact, Pauline remembers periodically seeing Stan show up in Winnipeg and New Brunswick to visit with Pauline's mother. So it was a surprise, but not a total shock when Pauline's mother confessed to her that in fact she and Stan had fallen in love. And in fact, they had had a secret relationship from the time they lived in Vancouver. But this revelation was nothing compared to what Pauline heard next. Her mother explained that the reason they had had to move so many times during her childhood was because Pauline's father, Warren, was actually a mobster and was a key member of an organized crime syndicate in Vancouver. Right after they separated, Pauline's mother found out she had a hit put on her head because the mob now believed that the husband could not control her anymore and she knew too much. Stan also found out that he had a hit on his head because Ruth discovered that the mob wanted to kill him too because they knew about their relationship. And then also, apparently Stan was counseling a man that was in his congregation that wound up being a mobster and so the mob believed this man had given up critical information to Stan, making him even more of a liability. At first, Stan said he didn't believe any of this, but when he found out the man he had been counseling had been assassinated, he knew it was true. They decided not to tell the police and instead go into hiding together because Pauline's mother knew what happened to families that snitched on the mob. They were made examples of. And so when Pauline and her family moved to Winnipeg and then to New Brunswick, Stan actually moved there as well in tandem, which is why Pauline had seen him periodically showing up at their house to visit with Pauline's mother. Pauline was understandably completely shocked, but at the same time, she was kind of happy to have some sort of explanation for all the strange things that had happened in her childhood. And so over the course of the next several hours, Pauline sat in this motel room with her mother and Stan and asked them every question she could think of. And she discovered that whenever she came home from school and she found her mother furiously pulling all the food out of the fridge and the pantry, throwing it all away with no explanation, that was actually because they found out the mob had tried to poison them. Or the six different times Pauline was unenrolled from the school she was at and then moved to a different school across town, that was because there was a credible threat the mob had discovered where Pauline was going to school. And so by the end of the weekend, Pauline not only learned about this totally crazy past she had, but she also learned that she was still in danger. And so before Pauline headed back home, she asked her mother and Stan what she should do to stay safe. And Pauline's mother said, well, that's actually the reason we called you here now, because after all these years, we were just tired of being in hiding. And so we've already spoken to the authorities and they've moved us into a special witness protection program for families connected to the mob. When you enter this program, it's referred to as entering the weird world, where basically you're not really safe, but you have agents that follow you around that are undercover that track what you're doing and make sure there's no assassination attempt on you. And before Pauline could even ask, her mother told her that as a measure of her and Stan entering the weird world, they asked that a couple of agents monitor Pauline and her brother, even though they didn't know they were being monitored. At this point, Stan reached forward with a radio and he said, here's a radio that actually broadcasts to the agents that are following you pretty much all the time but you should only use it if you're truly in a desperate situation because as soon as you call out for help, there are gonna be people that are risking their lives to come save you. As Pauline is holding this radio, she looks at her mom and Stan and she says, well, what happened to dad? Is, is he in jail? And at this point, Pauline's mother says, no, he's not. He's in the weird world too. And she handed Pauline a letter that was from her father addressed to Pauline. And it basically spelled out that he had been moved into the weird world and he was looking forward to Pauline joining them at some point when she was ready. So now Pauline has this radio and this letter and she's looking at her mother and Stan and she's just totally overwhelmed. And her mother just tells her, go home, think about what you wanna do next. And if you want to join the witness protection program and join the weird world with us, just let me know and we'll make it happen. And so Pauline, who's in a total state of shock, gives her mom a hug and gives Stan a hug and says, okay, bye, I'll be in touch. And she leaves the motel and she gets in her car and she's about to back up when she looks and sees Stan running outside holding something in his hand. 
And so Pauline stops, Stan runs up to the window, and he says, hey, I forgot to give you this. And he held up this round piece of metal that he told her was a GPS transponder, it was magnetized, and she should put it out of sight underneath her car. And what it does is it constantly gives off her location to the agents that are following her. So if she was in trouble, it would be easier for them to find her. And so Pauline thanked him, put the transponder under her car, and Stan went back into the motel. And so Pauline went back home with the intention of just digesting this information, knowing that she was being being watched, she had this radio, she was, you know, relatively safe, and her plan was to just give it a couple of days before she committed to joining the witness protection program and joining the weird world. But after only a couple of days, her paranoia was so high that she dumped her boyfriend, she quit her job, and she moved out of her house into a separate apartment, and she called her mother and said, I can't take it anymore, I feel totally unsafe, I want to join the weird world. Her mother and Stan were delighted at her decision, but they told her it wasn't a simple process getting into the weird world that a lot of people were involved in her basically giving up her old life and entering this new one. And so Pauline's mother told her that she would be in touch with one of her agents and they would contact Pauline when it was time for her to go. And so anxious and scared, Pauline began to wait and wait and wait. And her mother said, oh, just give it some time. They'll be in touch soon. But the waiting dragged on for five years. And in that time, Pauline met a new boyfriend, Kevin, who became her husband. And in conversations with him, Pauline started to doubt this whole mafia thing was even true. And so she decided in order to find out if this really was a real thing, that the mafia was actually after them, that Pauline would need to set up a sting operation on her mother and Stan. And so Pauline called her mother and very convincingly told her that, oh my goodness, someone just broke into my apartment. I think it was someone from the mafia. I don't know what happened, but can you tell me what to do? Should I call the police? What do I do? And her mother said, no, don't call the police. Whatever you do, don't call the police. I'm gonna get in touch with Stan and see if he knows what to do. And just a couple of minutes later, Pauline's mother called back and said, okay, honey, I spoke to Stan and he spoke to the undercover agents that sit outside your house and have been watching you for all these years. And they said that yes, unfortunately, not one, but two men from the mafia broke into your house today. But luckily they went up, they grabbed them, they're in custody, so you're safe now. And Pauline said, mom, I made that up. No one's been in my apartment. I've been here the whole day. I lied to you. No one broke in. And it was at this point that Pauline realized her mother and Stan had been living a lie since she was five years old. There was no mafia. Her father was not a mobster in some Vancouver crime syndicate. It was all made up. It would turn out Stan was suffering from something called delusion syndrome, where totally normal people that are totally lucid and have normal lives have one distinct delusion. And sometimes that delusion is not a big deal, but sometimes it is, like they believe the mafia is after them. And during his relationship with Pauline's mother, he passed on his delusion to her through something called folly ado, which translates to madness for two, which is shared delusion syndrome, where someone who's delusional, who's a dominant personality, can pass that on to a subordinate personality. After confronting her mother and then also confronting Stan at a later date, neither of them said, this is a lie, you're right, you caught us, because they believed it. And they took to their graves the belief that the mafia was after them. Their biggest concern after Pauline said, this isn't true, was not that they had been exposed as potential frauds. It was that, oh no, Pauline's gonna expose herself to the mafia because she's not using her GPS transponder or her radio or living in the weird world with us. She's gonna get assassinated by the mafia. And so even though Pauline never got an apology from her mother or got to really talk about the insanity of this whole situation because again, her mother and Stan took to the graves the belief that the mafia was in fact after them, Pauline ultimately made peace with the situation by writing a best-selling memoir called Run, Hide, Repeat. It is linked in the description below. Check it out. In November of 2004, 52-year-old Peter Porco and his wife, 54-year-old Joan Porco, were like so many other middle-aged, middle-class Americans. They lived in Del Mar, New York, in a comfortable two-story home, and they worked for a living. Peter was an appellate court clerk, and Joan was a speech pathologist. They had been married for over 30 years, and they had two sons. Christopher was a 21-year-old student at the University of Rochester, and his brother, Jonathan, was a 23-year-old naval officer stationed at a submarine base in Groton, Connecticut. On Monday, November 15th, 2004, Peter woke up to start his typical Monday morning work routine. 
He got up, he got out of bed, he went into the bathroom, he relieved himself, he looked in the mirror, he shaved, he got dressed in his work clothes, he went downstairs, he put on a pot of coffee. While the coffee was brewing, he unloaded the dishwasher and then put the dirty dishes into the dishwasher and started it. He wanted to get his newspaper, so he went outside, he got his newspaper, but he realized he locked himself out of the front door. So he got the spare key out from underneath the mat, opened the front door, went inside, he sat down, had some coffee, read the newspaper. After a few minutes, he put his coffee cup in the sink, he packed himself a lunch in his lunchbox, and then he headed for the door to head for work. Peter was known as a very reliable employee who was also very punctual and rarely missed work. So when he didn't get to work that Monday morning, the court was a little bit confused. They called him to see if he was okay. He didn't pick up. So they dispatched a court officer to go make sure he was okay. And so the officer arrives at his house. He sees cars in the driveway, the front door shut. He goes up, he knocks on the door, nobody answers. He tries the handle of the front door. He realizes it's open. So he opens the door and he yells out, hey, I'm just looking for Peter. And the door hits something on the ground pokes his head inside and looks down and there on the ground the thing blocking the door is peter porco's body he's clearly deceased and he clearly has a massive head wound the court officer steps outside immediately, calls 911. Local police show up, they go inside, and sure enough, Peter is dead. They go upstairs and they find his wife, Joan, in bed, also with a massive head wound, but she was still alive. Joan was rushed to a hospital where she underwent emergency surgery and then was put into a medically induced coma. Meanwhile, the police began their investigation into who could have done this. They quickly discovered that the home's alarm system had been smashed and a phone line, because there still was landlines at the time, had been cut from the outside and a screen in one of the windows had been slashed that looked like the way someone climbed into the house. However, nothing appeared to have been stolen because police almost immediately found Peter's wallet with money inside of it still sitting in the house, as well as very expensive jewelry that belonged to Joan still sitting in the house. As they continued to search the house, they discovered a fireman's ax that belonged to the Porcos hidden inside of one of the bedroom closets. And it was very clear this was the murder weapon. The Porco sons had been away during this attack. John was on his submarine in Connecticut and Chris was at the University of Rochester. And in fact, Chris found out about the attack on his parents when he saw a news report because this story of this innocent, typical seeming American couple in a quiet suburb getting struck down by some ax wielding maniac had gone totally viral and it was all over the news. And so Chris called the police to get more information about his parents' death. Here's the recording. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Porco. I was just called by the Times Union saying that my parents were found dead this afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you had any information on me. Hey, Chris, Sorry, I'm, more about Saria. I'm at school in Rochester, New York. Okay, you're at, in Rochester? Yes. Okay, and you're hearing from the Times Union? Yeah, they said my, my parents were found, um, I guess, dead. I don't know, they didn't say how or anything. So you will be here probably, you're going to go right to Albany Med? Uh, I don't know. What, what, I don't even know where my mom is. But yeah, she is at Albany Med. Okay. Do, do you know her condition? Uh, in no, because I haven't talked to her. Let me give you my pager number. As you can tell, Chris is extremely emotional. He's beside himself. He can barely speak. He's so upset about what's happened to his parents. No, actually, he sounds as calm as if he's ordering a pizza. Because Chris Porco was actually a psychopath, and he was the one who attacked his parents with the axe. As it turns out, Chris was failing at school and taking out huge loans in his father's name by forging his signature. And his father found out about it. So Mr. and Mrs. Porco write their son a strongly worded email where they tell him this behavior has to stop, and they're very disappointed in him, but they love him and they will help him get back on his feet. Chris responded by driving home in the middle of the night, sneaking into his house and attacking his parents with an ax. While this case is already disturbing and horrific and tragic, it's what happens to Chris's father after the attack that makes it one of the most brutal cases of all time. After being struck 16 times in the head and laying unconsciously in his bed as his son snuck out of his house, Peter suddenly sat up and began his morning routine. He got dressed, he went to the bathroom, he shaved, he went downstairs, he made coffee, he did his chores, he went outside to get the newspaper, he got locked out, he got the key from under the mat, went back inside, he packed his own lunch. When he was finally ready to go, he headed for the door and then he collapsed and he died. Due to the severity of Peter's head wound, his brain was basically broken and it was unable to recognize he had been gravely injured. So in his final moments, he believed it was just a typical Monday morning going about his work routine, when in reality, he had a gaping head wound and he was basically dead after the 16th blow to his head. One of the more surprising and heart-wrenching details of this case is that Joan Porco, she did survive the attack. 
And after she came out of that medically induced coma, she said she forgot all the details of the attack, even though when she was discovered in her bed, she did indicate that Chris, her son, was the attacker. Nonetheless, she got together $250,000 to post Chris's bail, and she allowed him to come stay with her during his trial. And the two attended the trial together, walking into the courthouse hand in hand. Chris was very quickly found guilty of killing his father and attempting to kill his mother, and he was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. Despite the verdict, Joan Porco still speaks to Christopher over the phone and frequently visits him in prison. It's unclear if she still believes he is innocent. In 2017, an electrician named Pete had become accustomed to doing work in basements and sub-basements of older buildings in Baltimore, Maryland. He discovered that many times when he worked in a stretch of older buildings right next to each other, that in the basement or sub-basement, there would be a stretch of tunnel that connected each building to each other, kind of like a common door in a hotel room. One day, Pete was asked to install some new lights in the sub-basements of three very old buildings that were all right next to each other. Apparently, someone had purchased the entire building complex after they had sat there abandoned for some time. When Pete arrived, his foreman, whose name was Mike, was waiting for him outside the farthest east building. And so Pete got out, walked up to the building, and Mike led him down to the basement and then down another flight of stairs into the sub-basement. The first thing Pete did was pull his flashlight out and look around and see if there was a tunnel connecting to the adjoining buildings, because if there was, it would make his life a lot easier. And sure enough, he shined his light to the west and there was a tunnel. And so he knew he wouldn't need to lug his gear up and over after he was done with each building. After that, Pete and Mike set up floodlights inside of that first sub-basement they were going to be working in, and then they put their gear on and they got to work. After a few hours of Pete being really focused on what he was working on, he looked up and realized Mike was gone, and he assumed he must have gone upstairs for a lunch break, and Pete, who had had a really big breakfast, wasn't that hungry, but wanted to take a break, so he decided instead of eating, he would just go explore the other sub-basements. So Pete walked over to that first tunnel that went into the second building, he walked through it, it wasn't very far, maybe five or six feet to get into the next building. Once he got into that second building, it was totally dark because neither he nor Mike had actually gotten in there yet. And so Pete pulled his flashlight out and he scanned around the room and he saw directly on the other side, still going west across the building complex, was yet another tunnel connected to the third and final building. And so Pete walked through the second sub-basement, shining around, looking for anything interesting. There was nothing down there. He got to that tunnel, he walked through, and he entered into the third and final room of the entire building complex. And so he lifted his flashlight up and he scanned around the room, and he was shocked when on the other side, still going west, as if there was a fourth building, there was another tunnel. Pete kept his flashlight trained on this tunnel, and he's thinking to himself, did I get something wrong here? Is there really four buildings? Because I'm almost positive there was three. There shouldn't be a tunnel over there because there's no more buildings. And so he's really intrigued. And so he keeps his flashlight up and he starts walking across the room towards this tunnel. And he gets about halfway across this sub-basement when he hears someone's voice come out of this mysterious tunnel. And it sounds an awful lot like Mike's. And Pete would say that his initial reaction to this was, oh, I guess Mike must have had his lunch break and then come back down here and started doing the same thing I'm doing, exploring the other sub-basements. And so he's already checked out this tunnel and he wants to show me what's down there. So Pete walks over to this tunnel and he shines his light inside and and right away he can tell it's different than the other two tunnels he's walked through because those went straight across and this tunnel he's looking at goes down and kind of bends off to the right. And so totally unconcerned because he believes Mike is down there already, he starts walking down this winding tunnel. After walking for a couple of minutes just straight down into this tunnel, he finally walks into this huge room with 20 foot high ceilings and he lifts his flashlight up and he looks around and there's no Mike and he yells out for him, he doesn't hear him, but he noticed in the middle of the room were all these small animal skeletons that had been arranged in a big triangle on the ground. And as he scanned across the ground with his light, he came to the right side of the room at one of the points of the triangle. And at the top of that point was this large dog-like skeleton lying on the ground. It looked as if the triangle was more like an arrow and it was pointed at this one large dog. Pete went back to looking around the room and he saw right across from him was another tunnel entrance into more unexplored passageway. And for a second, he thought about just turning around and leaving because this whole thing was starting to give him the creeps. But then he heard what sounded like Mike's voice again calling from that unexplored tunnel. And so he decided 
decided, okay, I'll walk a little bit farther to see what Mike wants. And so Pete carefully walked across this room, being careful not to step on any of the bones. And right before he walked into this new tunnel, he pulled his phone out in case he might have service and he could just call Mike and see what he wanted. But he had no service on his phone, so he entered the new tunnel. Unlike the other tunnel that went down the whole time, this new tunnel was totally flat, but it was a little bit more narrow. And so as he's walking, it's kind of zigging and zagging, and it's just getting a little bit tight on his shoulders as he's moving. And after a couple of minutes of walking and yelling out for Mike and not hearing from him, he just stops and he just thinks, is this a good idea? Should I keep walking down this strange tunnel or should I just go back and meet Mike back up in the sub basement? And as he's standing there facing away from the direction he just came, he thinks he hears something behind him. So Pete turns around and shines his light and there's no one there. He yells out for Mike and Mike doesn't yell back. And then Pete hears the faint clicking sound of something moving on all fours in the chamber he had just come from. And he's thinking to himself, what could have gotten down here? There's only one way in and I've taken the other tunnel. Did I miss some dog that was staying in the middle there? I think I would have seen an animal that was moving around. And so as he's thinking about this, he realizes the clicking sounds have stopped. It's gone completely silent. And so he stops and he's just intently listening. And then all of a sudden, whatever it is out there starts running at full speed down the tunnel towards Pete. And so Pete immediately turns around and starts sprinting down this unexplored tunnel. All he hears behind him is this animal at full sprint grunting and bouncing into walls as it gains on him. And finally, after what felt like an eternity, but was probably only a few seconds, Pete gets to the end of this tunnel and he sees it's a small flight of stairs to a large metal door. He runs up and he grabs the door and he tries to open it and it opens. He runs outside, pulls it shut, hears it click, and then he sinks down with his back against the door, pressing up against it to ensure it stays shut. And as Pete is sitting there, he hears this thing come barreling into the room where this door is, and it rams into the door, and he feels it shake the door forward, but the door holds. And then whatever it was just lost interest, turned around and left. Even though this animal appeared to be gone and the door appeared to hold, Pete stayed sitting with his back up against the door for a couple of minutes while he composed himself. He really didn't know what to make of what just happened because he's thinking to himself, that animal had to have been huge. It just nearly barreled this door down. I felt the whole door shake. I mean, if that's a dog, that is a huge dog. And also, where's Mike? Mike's the whole reason I went into this tunnel in the first place. He was calling to me, or so I thought he was, and I never saw him. And so Pete's totally confused, and he's traumatized, and he's looking around, and he's finally taking stock of where he is, and he realizes he's under one of the docks of what would turn out to be the Four Seasons Hotel, which meant he was at least about a half mile away from where he had started in the sub-basement of those buildings. Pete stood up and made his way up to the sidewalk where he called Mike. And Mike was very confused at what Pete was telling him because he said, I never went into that tunnel. I never went into the other sub-basements. At my lunch break, I just went upstairs and got a bite to eat. And when I came down, you were gone. And so Pete started talking about the animal he saw. And as he was describing it, he's thinking to himself how crazy he must sound. And he began to realize that it just, it had to be, you know, a stray dog got in there and he just must not have seen it and, and that was it. And so after they hang up, Pete is left thinking to himself, you know, if that was a stray dog, then what were those bones arranged in that triangle for? And why did they seem to be an arrow pointing at that other bigger dog? And also who was yelling to me inside of the tunnel if it wasn't Mike? But when Pete and Mike got back to those old buildings, they did not do any more exploration. It was like they were just not gonna talk about what happened. Instead, they put a fold up table in front of that tunnel that led down to the room filled with bones and whatever animal was down there. And they rushed the job in all the sub basements, got all the lights up as fast as they could. The last thing they did was they moved the table back out of the way and then ran up out of the building and never looked back. There is a large abandoned factory on the outskirts of Cleveland, Ohio, that used to be a prominent rubber company, but in the late 1970s, when they closed down business, nobody else leased the factory space, and so for decades, it remained untouched. In the 1980s, a boy named Kurt was born in Cleveland, and from a young age, he was fascinated by this abandoned factory. He really wanted to see what was inside, but his dad would never take him, saying it was way too dangerous to go in there. And so over the years, Kurt still wanted to see what was inside, but his fascination with it kind of waned because he was never allowed to go. Then in the late 1990s, when Kurt was in high school, he happened to be walking by the factory after leaving a friend's house and he stopped and he looked at his watch and it was 8 p.m. He didn't have to be home for about an hour and a half. 
and he looked up at the crumbling brick building and he thought to himself, you know what? It's now or never. I have to see what's inside of there. And so he walks right up to the factory. There's no fences around it to stop him. And he gets up there and he sees that all the doors are sealed shut. And so he's a little bit disheartened and he starts walking around the property. And when he gets to the backside, he sees on one of the corners of the building, the concrete has just fallen off, exposing a fairly large hole in the side of the building that he could just walk right through. And so he slipped through and he looked inside this building that he's been thinking about for years and years and years. And he would say it was just so cool. There were all these boats that had just been left in storage inside of this factory and then were apparently forgotten about. There were all these conveyor belts and big pieces of factory equipment that had just been kind of left out on the floor and no one thought to break them down or even try to sell them. And then like any other good abandoned building, there was lots of drug paraphernalia scattered all over the ground. And so for the next hour, Kurt just explored the first floor and made his way up to the second floor where the manager's office was. And all in all, it was just a really awesome experience many years in the making. And at some point he looked at his watch and it was getting late and he realized he needed to leave. And so as he was getting ready to leave, he could have sworn he heard the sound of music being played from somewhere in the factory. And so he stopped and he turned around and he just listened for a second to see if he really was hearing music. And he was, it was someone playing the blues somewhere in the factory. Because Kurt had obsessed over this factory for so many years, wondering what was inside, now that there was some mystery about what was in here, he couldn't just leave. He had to go look and see where that music was coming from. And so Kurt began walking across the factory floor in the direction where he thought this music was coming from. And he reached a wall that was covered by a big blue tarp. And that's where it seemed to be coming from, like it was coming from the other side of the wall. And so he went up to put his ear against this wall. And when he did, he almost fell into the tarp because behind the tarp was actually a stairwell that led down into the basement. And so again, because because Kurt was so fascinated by this place, he had to see what was down there. And so he grabs the tarp and he pulls it aside and he starts looking downstairs and he can tell there's a light on down there. And so he's telling himself, okay, it's possible someone could be down there. But again, he's gonna go down, he's gonna have a look. He pulls the tarp completely aside, he steps into the stairwell, and he begins walking down. And from his perspective, he would not be able to see any of the basement until he got all the way to the bottom. There was no gaps in the railing. It was basically solid wall all the way down. And when he got to the bottom, he could only turn left. Turning right was just a dead end left was towards the main section of the basement. And so he goes all the way down the steps, his heart is racing because he's half expecting to see someone come running up to him. And right before he breaks the corner when he can actually see into the basement, he takes a deep breath and then very slowly he kind of pokes his head around the corner and gets a look inside the basement. It's a very odd scene in there, but there doesn't appear to be any people. And so Kurt took the last couple of steps down to the bottom. He turned the corner and actually got a full look at the basement. And sitting in the middle of the room is a cassette player with the play button pressed down that's playing the music. So he's found the origin of the music. And then he starts looking around and realizes on all of the walls are pieces of paper, hundreds of them, that have all been plastered to the walls that all say the exact same three words. She gotta run. They're everywhere. Then he looks in the back corner and he sees there is this large wooden animal sculpture, although he can't tell what kind of animal it is, but clearly someone has been hacking at it with a hammer or a saw or maybe both, and it's been burned. It looks like someone's been taking a lot of frustration out on it. And then in the other corner, away from this animal sculpture, was this chair that appeared to have been removed from a school desk and it was angled towards the corner of the room. And then behind it on the ground was this massive stack of VHS tapes, and each of them had a woman's name on it. And Kurt, from a distance, could only make out one name, which was Jessica, but he could clearly see there was a bunch of other tapes with different names on them. Kurt suddenly was not feeling brave anymore and wanted to get out of there immediately, because at this point, he's pretty certain that whoever's down here is not a good person. They got some bad stuff going on down here. And so he turns around and he starts walking up the stairs. He makes his way across the factory floor and he finally gets to the crack in the cement and he makes his way out and he's out to safety again. Even though Kurt was really excited about having finally explored the factory, on his walk home, it dawned on him that while he was there, someone had to have manually pressed the play button on that tape recorder that was playing the music because it wasn't playing when he got there. So either he miraculously avoided ever making contact with this person or group of people inside of this factory while he explored it for over an hour, or the more likely scenario is as soon as Kurt walked inside, this person or group of people knew he was there and were watching him the whole time. And maybe when they hit play on that cassette player and started playing that music, that was just an attempt to lure Kurt down into the basement. Who knows what would have happened if he had stayed even longer? And who knows what's on those VHS tapes?
To this day, Kurt and all of his friends are convinced he was in the presence of a serial killer. In 2013, three 12 year olds named Paul, Tim, and Max were living in New Orleans. And even though they were too young to remember Hurricane Katrina from 2005, the devastation it left in its wake was around them every day. Just down the street from their neighborhood was a row of houses that had all been abandoned after they were destroyed by the storm surge. And Paul, who was the ringleader of the group, would routinely drag Tim and Max into that row of houses to look for treasure, but they rarely left with anything more than some old clothes and some broken kitchenware. One day, Paul told Tim and Max that if they wanted to find some real treasure, they would have to go looking inside of the abandoned hospital. Despite it being completely boarded up, windows, doors, and a huge fence around it, Paul said he had discovered an entrance in the back of the building. Tim and Max were not nearly as excited as Paul about this idea because all they had heard about this hospital was criminals lived inside of it. They had also heard that the basement was completely flooded and basically the whole structure was not safe. But Paul was really convincing because he told them they were being babies. And so they said, okay, well, we'll go with you then. So the boys drove their bikes the couple of miles over to where this hospital was, and they eventually reached the big chain link fence that surrounded the entire property with no trespassing signs all over it. Behind the fence, they saw this ominous entrance into this underground parking garage that even from the street level, you could look down and clearly see it was totally flooded with gross, stagnant, dark water. But the boys carried on and Paul led them to a section of the chain link fence that had been cut open. So the boys parked their bikes and locked them up and then crawled through the gap in the fence and began walking up the small parking lot that led up to the loading dock of the hospital. As they got closer, Paul pointed to a shed that was situated right underneath a broken out window on the second floor. And it was immediately clear that people were using the shed to climb up and through that window. Paul was the first one to climb onto the shed. And then from there, he jumped up and grabbed the ledge of the broken window and hoisted himself up and then very carefully climbed through. Once he got through, he turned around and yelled for the boys to come up. Once all three of them got inside and they began looking around, they were amazed at what they saw. There was all this medical equipment that had just been left out. Clearly there had not been an attempt at salvaging anything inside of this hospital. There were even blood samples still sitting out on tables. That day, the boys explored the entire floor they came in on, which was the second floor. And by the end of the day, they left with a couple of random medical souvenirs. Over the following few months, the boys kept coming back to the hospital and had eventually explored every room on every floor except for one, the basement. They wanted to go down there, but even Paul thought it was a bad idea because it was completely flooded with disgusting standing water and there were no windows that went down into the basement, so it was totally pitch black. But by the end of the summer, they were getting bored with all the other floors of the hospital. They had seen everything, they had found everything, there was nothing left to explore. And so they decided we're gonna go in the basement. So one afternoon, they put on some dirty old clothes that they didn't mind ruining, and they made their way over to the hospital. They parked their bikes, they snuck through the fence, they made their way up to the shed, they climbed up into the second floor, they walked down the second floor hallway down to the flight of stairs, they went down to the first floor where the stairs stopped. From there, they walked over to an access door that led to another flight of stairs that just went down into the basement. And so they open that door up, they step inside, and they get their flashlights out because it's pitch black inside of the stairwell, and they shine their light down the steps and it was a half flight of stairs that led to a dry landing and then there was another flight of stairs from the landing going down to the basement floor and the final steps of that second set of stairs were completely submerged. So with their flashlights up, they walk down the first flight of stairs to the landing, they turn around and they stop and they shine their light into the basement. And what they see is just deep, dark, murky standing water. And from their perspective, the basement was not some huge sprawling open space like you would imagine. Instead, they were looking down at a wall because there was this hallway that ran perpendicular to the stairs. And so it went all the way to the right and all the way to the left, but they couldn't see down either of them. They could only see basically the landing of the stairs. And in order to look down the hall, they would need to go into the water and walk a few feet into the hall. And so as the boys are just scanning their flashlights into this murky water inside of this small segment of the basement that they could see, Paul finally says, all right, you know what? Screw it, I'm going. And he slowly walks down that final flight of stairs and he takes his first step into the water. And Tim and Max, they stay up on the landing. They're gonna let Paul go on his own first. Paul takes another step and another step. And before long, he says he's reached the basement floor and he's up to his chest in this disgusting water. And so he's keeping his arms high up out of the water. He's still got his flashlight and he wades out to the point where he can actually look down the hallway in either direction. 
And so he looks down one way, and then he looks down the other way, and then he turns around to face Tim and Max, who are still back up on the landing, and he says, you can't see down either hallway. There's huge filing cabinets, and there's a generator down there, and I can't see in either direction. We probably can't go very far. At this point, Tim and Max feel compelled to go down there with their friend, and so they walk down that final flight of stairs into the water, and they wade their way over next to Paul, at which point they shine their lights down the hall, and sure enough, they basically can't see anything past maybe five or six meters down each hallway. As the boys were standing in the middle of the hallway, not making any moves in either direction, they suddenly hear something down the far right side of the hallway. And they shine their lights and they realize their view is completely obstructed and whatever's made the sound, they can't see it. It's blocked by the generator and the filing cabinet. And as they're shining their lights, they still can't see anything. They hear a massive splash, like someone cannonballed at the far end of the hallway. And the boys do not stick around to try to get a better angle to see it. They immediately turn around and run as fast as they can, or as fast as the water will allow them, back to the steps, back to the landing, back to the first floor, back to the second floor, down the hall, out the window, and they run all the way back to their bikes. And by the time they're back there, they're panting, they're soaking wet, they haven't spoken yet. It was like intuitive fight or flight, and they were out of there. And they're sitting there heaving, and they look at each other, and they start laughing. It was like this adrenaline rush. It was crazy what they were doing. And they look back up at the hospital, and they're staring at the second floor window, almost half expecting to see whoever it was that made this big splashing sound to suddenly emerge in the window, but no one ever did. And after about an hour of just staring at the hospital and seeing no activity whatsoever, they convinced themselves that whatever they heard down in that hallway was probably just something falling off a shelf or maybe there's a bird down there, but whatever it was, it was harmless. Eventually, Paul says to Tim and Max that they should totally go back in there and try to figure out what it was that made that sound. And initially, Tim and Max are like, I don't really want to do that. But eventually, after Paul called them babies enough times, they said, okay, fine, we'll go back in the hospital. And so they go back through the fence, they walk up the parking lot, they climb onto the second floor, they walk down the hall, they go down the stairs, they get to that access door that leads down into the basement. And before they just fling it open, Paul gets his flashlight up, he turns the handle and he opens the door just a little bit and looks inside to see if anybody's in there. And there isn't, so he opens the door the rest of the way and he, Tim, and Max go inside. Once they're inside, they shine their light down to the landing and they can still see their wet footprints all over the steps. It's silence inside of the basement. They make their way down to the landing, they turn around they shine the light into the water in the basement itself and now the water is completely calm again there's no motion it's still completely quiet and as they're standing there looking it's clear all of them are hesitating they don't want to go back into chest deep murky stagnant water and they also don't know what it was that made that sound while they were outside they're really confident it wasn't a big deal but now that they're in this dark basement, it seemed a little bit more intimidating. And so Tim suggests they throw something into the water to try to get a reaction from whatever this thing is, if it's alive. But they didn't have anything to throw. And then Paul, out of nowhere, takes his flashlight and throws it into the water. And before Tim or Max could react to what he just did, they all just stopped and listened to see if that would cause a reaction from whatever it was down there. And as the flashlight sunk to the bottom and completely out of view because the water was so murky, there was no reaction down there. It was still completely silent. Paul turns to Tim and Max and says, the reason I threw it is now we have to go in because I have to get my flashlight. So Paul, along with Tim and Max, make their way down that final flight of stairs. They start walking into the water. They get all the way up to their chest in water and they wade out until Paul is directly over the light. He can barely see it through the murky water, but he can clearly see it below him. And since he doesn't want to go under the water, he tried to use his feet to get the light up, but he couldn't do it. And so he looks at Tim and Max and he goes, I'm going under. He takes a deep breath and he goes under the water. He immediately hears the muffled screams of Tim and Max up on the surface. And as he's fumbling for his light, he feels one of them yank on his shirt to try to pull him up and out of the water. Paul manages to grab his flashlight. He comes out of the water and he turns and he sees Tim and Max booking it for the stairs. And before he can even turn around and run after them, he realizes why they're running in the first place. To his right, he can hear the sound of something huge swimming up the hallway towards him. For a brief second, he raises his flashlight and shines it down the hall and right at the filing cabinet this dark silhouette that's in the water that's lying horizontal in the water is violently swimming up the hall towards him so fast there is a wake of water coming off of it. Paul turns and runs towards the stairs or as fast as he can go. He's trying to wade through this water that's chest deep on him. He gets to the stairs. He runs up to the landing. He can see his friends are up at the door leading out of the basement stairwell and they're yelling for him to hurry up, hurry up. 
that got the door open, Paul turns the corner and runs up to that door. And right as he's leaving, he can hear whatever it was that was swimming down the hall has stopped and is now on the stairs. He goes to the access door and he and his buddies run upstairs to the second floor. They run down the hallway. They get into that room. They leap out the window onto the shed, onto the ground, and they run all the way out to the break in the fence where they hop in their bikes and they bike away. And as they're leaving, they turn around to look and there's no one. There's no one in the window. There's no one outside on the property. Whoever or whatever was chasing them is still in the hospital. The boys believe it was an alligator living in the basement of this hospital, but they never found out for sure. While they continued to urban explore around New Orleans, they never went back to that hospital. From 2000 to 2013, Cornelius Mike Anderson miraculously turned his life around. Growing up in a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, Mike was a troubled young man that seemed destined for jail time. But something changed for him in the year 2000 when he was 23 years old. Suddenly he wanted to make the most out of his life. So he distanced himself from his old friends and he moved to a different suburb outside of St. Louis called Webster Groves. There he started a successful construction company. He got married, divorced, married again. He had three kids and became the father to a stepchild. He was very active in his community, volunteering countless hours at his church, as well as becoming a youth football coach. Anyone that met Mike after the year 2000 only had wonderful things to say about him. But Mike had a big secret about his past that he was just hoping never saw the light of day. Back in 1999, when Mike was 23 years old, he robbed a Burger King outside of St. Louis at gunpoint. He was arrested in the year 2000, convicted of armed robbery, and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Shortly after his conviction, he was out on bail pending the outcome of his appeal. But when his appeal was denied in May of 2002, Mike was expecting to go back to jail. And so he asked his lawyer, you know, what are the next steps? Because I'm out on bail. Do I go to the jail? Do, do they come to get me? And his lawyer said, oh no, they'll issue a warrant for your arrest. They will come to your house and they will take you to jail. So Mike got his affairs in order and he waited to go to jail but no one ever showed up. And so days turned into weeks, turned into years, and no one ever took Mike to jail. Because it would turn out the state had made a clerical error and they believed Mike was already behind bars when he was actually just at his home. And in July of 2013, at the end of his original 13 year sentence, they went to go release him from prison. That's when they realized he had never been incarcerated. So eight US Marshals immediately went to his house and they arrested him and they brought him to jail. And there was this huge public outcry that it was totally unjust that you're arresting him now because it's the state's fault that they did not bring him to jail. It's not Mike's fault. And Mike used that opportunity to become a totally changed man. And so after a number of of appeals and this very public petition of people trying to get Mike out of jail, a judge finally took a closer look at Mike's case. And it would take this judge only 10 minutes to come to the conclusion that Mike was in fact a changed man and should not have to serve the rest of his sentence. And so although Mike was held for nine months after being rearrested, he was released and today he is a free man. The Trump family were by all accounts a normal, hardworking household. 51-year-old Mark Trump and his wife, 53-year-old Kobe Trump, had established a successful red currant farm and earth moving business at their property in Sylvan, which is just outside of Melbourne. Their three adult children, which were 29-year-old Rihanna, 25-year-old Mitchell, and 22-year-old Ella, all lived and worked with them at the farm. But their seemingly ordinary lives would change forever on Monday, August 29th, 2016. That day, without any warning, the family dumped their passports, credit cards, and cell phones on the kitchen table and ran out the front door, leaving it unlocked. They hopped into Ella's car and drove north. 30 kilometers into their journey, and it was discovered that the son, Mitchell, still had his phone. And so the others yelled at him to throw it out the window. And so he did, he chucked his phone out the window. The family drove all day and night until they reached a motel in the New South Wales town of Bathurst, 800 kilometers away to the west of Sydney. The following morning, Mitchell decided he did not want to be a part of whatever it was they were doing. And so he abandoned his family and began heading home. The remaining four family members did not go after Mitchell. Instead, 
instead, they just piled back in the car and drove east to a popular tourist destination called the Genelin Caves. It was there that the two daughters, Rihanna and Ella, decided that they also did not want to be a part of whatever it was they were doing, and so they snuck away from their parents and stole a car and began heading home. The parents, after realizing their daughters had now left, did nothing. They did not go after them. The two sisters drove south to the town of Goldburn, where they called the police to report their parents missing. The story made its way into the media, where the family was initially ridiculed for getting lost in the first place and getting completely separated in an area they should know well. This is their country. It's not a remote area. They were near big established towns the entire time. It just didn't make sense. But when police went to the Trump family farm back in Sylvan, and they decided discovered the front door was unlocked, there were credit cards, passports, and phones on the table, suddenly it seemed like there was a lot more to this case than met the eye. And so as this strangeness came into focus in the media, people stopped ridiculing the family and began speculating what caused them to suddenly flee their house. Was it something in the water they were drinking? Was there chemicals on the farm that was screwing up their brain? Were they running from someone? Were they in debt? You know, what was it that caused this strange sudden departure? Back in Goldburn, after reporting their parents missing, Rihanna and Ella inexplicably separated at a gas station. Rihanna just climbed in the back of some utility truck and Ella hopped in the stolen vehicle and started driving home. Later that night, Ella would become the first Trump family member to be located by police when she arrived at the farm and police were waiting for her there. Mitchell would arrive back home the following morning after taking a series of trains to get there. Once Mitchell and Ella were reunited, they made a statement to the media outside of the family farm. And as you're looking at them, it's clear they're totally shell-shocked. They don't know what's happened. And they're trying to articulate why their family left in the first place and what they were doing and where they're going and the best they could do was to say well there was a lot of pressure on our family and it was it was building up and these things are just difficult to explain and and I don't really know what we were doing. Mitchell would say that there was a belief that people were after them there was some paranoia there but that paranoia was predominantly held by their parents. While Mitchell and Ella were certainly in a state of shock they did seem mentally stable. The same could not be said for their sister, Rihanna. She was discovered by the driver of the truck she had snuck into after he had driven over an hour away. He had pulled over to check on something. He had gone around the back and then had the life scared out of him when he saw Rihanna just sitting there in a what he called catatonic state. She didn't know her name. She didn't know where she was. She was just sitting there. Rihanna was taken to the Goldburn Hospital where she was put into their psychiatric unit. As media interest grew, the parents, Mark and Kobe, got back in their car up at the Genelin Caves and drove south towards Melbourne. A day later on Wednesday, the pair had driven 600 kilometers to the Victorian town of Wangaratta, where they too inexplicably separated. Kobe turned around and started heading north again by means which are still a mystery, and a day later was found 350 kilometers away in the town of Yas in a very agitated state. She was taken to a hospital there, but then transferred to the Goldburn Psychiatric Unit to be with her daughter, Rihanna. Mark stayed in Wangaratta, and he was there for several days, and during his time there, he was spotted by a young couple really aggressively tailgating them and then he was spotted again on another day fleeing from the car he had been driving. Finally on Saturday evening all of the Trump family members were accounted for when Mark was finally discovered sitting next to the road near the Wangaratta airport. He was questioned by police and then assessed by a mental health officer and then was released into the custody of his brother who was a police officer. And as they drove away Mark turned around and flipped off the photographers that had converged on the spot. He later released released a more contrite statement apologizing for the hurt and concern that were caused by these events and he also paid respect to the police and the volunteers that went out looking for them. After the investigation, the police determined that nobody was chasing this family. They were not in any danger. The family had also not taken any drugs. They were not in debt. They were not involved in any sort of religious cult. And prior to this strange event, the family had no history of mental health issues. After the dust had settled and the Trump family was just back at their farm going about their normal life, every media outlet wanted an interview with them to try to learn more about why this strange thing happened. But the family said, we're not doing interviews, we're not putting out any more statements, we just want to be left alone. And so as a result, all people could do was theorize. And the leading theory was that the Trump family was suffering from something called folly adieu, which is a French term that means madness for two. 
And what happens is one person who is delusional can pass that delusion on to other people. And this typically only happens in very close-knit families or in very tight romantic relationships. While it's unclear which of the Tromps became psychotic first, doctors say it is clear at some point they were in a cycle of reinforcing each other's delusions if this folly ado theory is the right one. While the full reasons for why the Tromps went on this strange voyage will probably never be known, the police deemed it a family matter and did not press charges. In 2007, 35-year-old Eva Vizhnirska was a member of the German national paragliding team. Over the previous two years, Eva had competed in 10 of the world's biggest paragliding competitions, and she had won six of them, making her the top female paraglider in the world. So coming into that year, Eva was very motivated to work extra hard to make sure she retained that title as world champion. On February 24th of that year, Ava was preparing her gear alongside 200 other paragliders on Mount Bora in New South Wales, Australia. This was Ava's last training opportunity before her first major competition of that year, which was scheduled for the next week. As they were getting ready to launch, one of the coaches walked in front of the group and made an announcement. He said storm clouds have been spotted to the north, but the forecast was a little bit ambiguous. It wasn't clear if the storm was gonna move over their training area or not. So it was up to each of the paragliders if they still wanted to launch that day and risk the bad weather. Ava, who was really eager to get this training flight in, looked at the sky and saw that it was pretty gray, but decided that she was gonna do it. Worst case scenario, she would have to cut it short. The rest of the German national team, they didn't wanna take the risk, and so they stayed grounded that day. Ava took a little bit longer preparing her gear, so by the time she was lining up on the cliff, she was only one of a handful of people that remained. And so strapped into her glider, she took a good run forward and launched herself up into the air. On the ground, the rest of the German national team followed in a van to track her progress and checked in with her from time to time with their radio. The first part of Ava's journey was incredibly calm. She followed the ridge line from Mount Bora for 12 miles until it ended, at that point, she entered into the skies over the vast savanna. As her GPS and tracking log ticked, tracking her progress, two large thunderstorm clouds appeared in front of her, one larger than the other. The vast majority of the other paragliders that had launched that day had launched ahead of Ava, and so when these clouds appeared, they had already passed that section, and so they didn't need to contend with the storm. As for Ava and the other two people she was with, which was an Austrian team member and a Chinese team member, they had a decision to make. They could either immediately ground their flight to avoid the storm, or they could attempt to dodge it. They chose the latter. They knew it was too dangerous to try to fly underneath these clouds because of something called updraft. At the beginning of storms, warm air is sucked up from the ground up into these clouds, and a paraglider, if they get caught in that, can get sucked up with the air into the storm. And so Ava and the other two paragliders began aggressively flying around the outside of these clouds when all of a sudden the storm completely changed. The big cloud overtook the small cloud, creating this 12 mile wide cumulonimbus cloud that now all three paragliders were stuck inside of. Any updraft is dangerous to a paraglider, but the updraft of a cumulonimbus cloud is famously dangerous because it's extremely powerful and it lasts for over an hour. The Austrian man was able to pull down on one toggle, point his feet, and begin spiraling all the way out of the grasp of this updraft. And he said he turned to look at the other two and he didn't see the Chinese man, but he did see Ava, and she was desperately trying to do what he was doing and spiral down, but she was clearly caught in the updraft and he watched her get pulled up into the black cloud out of view. By the time the Austrian man hit the ground, he would say it had become the worst thunderstorm he had ever seen with huge hail balls hitting the ground all around him. He took one more look up and he didn't see the Chinese man. He didn't see Ava anywhere. And he took off running for a barn to seek shelter. And when he was there, he pulled out his radio and he alerted the other teams of this emergency. Inside the cloud, Ava was hurtling up like a rocket. The storm was lifting her at a rate of 60 feet per second. There was nothing she could do to get out of this wind tunnel. Ava knew she was getting pulled towards the storm's eye in its vicious center because of the immense claps of thunder that just kept getting louder and louder and it also kept getting darker and darker all around her. In fact, it was pitch black except for the occasional flash of lightning that came very close to electrocuting her. As she desperately tried to keep her glider stable, she was able to place a radio call down to her team on the ground, but all she could say was, I can't see anything before it cut out. And at some point, Ava reached the eye of the storm where it's pitch black and the temperatures are freezing and hail balls the size of oranges are pelting her left and right. And the updraft kept pulling her higher and higher and higher until she passed out from a lack of oxygen. 
and at some point this updraft actually shot her up and out of the cloud. And while this meant she was out of the storm, she was now in air that was 50 degrees below zero, which meant everything, her face, her gloves, her clothes, the wings of her glider, everything completely froze. And to make matters worse, at the altitude she was at, there was almost no oxygen and she did not have a breathing apparatus. So by all accounts, Ava should be dead. But somehow, she didn't die. She just kept floating around above the storm cloud for 45 minutes. And then something happened. The ice on one side of the glider broke off, causing it to collapse, throwing her into a deadly free fall. And she's not in control. She's still unconscious. And she starts barreling back towards the ground like gravity has been turned back on again, going straight through the storm all over again. And so through the storm going at 90 feet per second, she clears the storm. And then right after getting out from underneath it, her glider miraculously just opens back up again. And the jerking motion of her suddenly stopping her free fall jolted her awake. And so she's looking around totally confused as she's gradually regaining consciousness and she's taking stock of where she is and she's still in the storm cloud but right at the bottom of it but luckily the updraft had stopped and so she was steady and she was able to reach up and grab her toggles and she was able to fly herself down to the ground and crash land and then she curled into a ball grabbed her radio and she called her team when they heard her voice, they could not believe she was alive because the other paraglider that got sucked up by the updraft, the guy from the Chinese national team, he unfortunately was struck by lightning and was killed. And so they were anticipating finding out that Ava had been struck by lightning as well. But Ava had not just survived. When they brought her to the hospital, they discovered that virtually nothing was wrong with her. She had some pretty bad bruises and cuts from the hail and she had a little bit of frostbite on her face, but it was treatable. And so the same day she was brought in, they discharged her. After leaving the hospital, Hospital, she and her teammates went back to the launch site so she could collect her gear and when they got there she looked at her GPS and the GPS had been tracking her entire flight the entire time she was up in that cloud and she showed her teammates what it said and they literally couldn't believe it. The screen showed she had reached an altitude of 32,634 feet which to put this in perspective is the same altitude you fly at inside of a commercial jet. So imagine being outside of your plane in the middle of a flight and that's how high she was. Another reference point is she was approximately 4,000 feet higher than the summit of Mount Everest. No human being had ever been that high unprotected and lived to tell the tale until Ava. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please remove all of the raisins from the Like Button's raisin brand 